This episode was made possible by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to begin monetizing your podcast, whether you're big or small. Podgo provides podcasters with a flat rate for ad space, so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member and you can too. Apply today at podgo.co to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. Hey guys, just to let you know that I have a promo of another podcast playing at the very end of this episode, so please stay tuned until then. That day, April 22nd, 1993, will stay with me for the rest of my life, whatever happens. He was... um, a well-mannered child, um, as we say, brought up the right way. Um, well-respected throughout the school, through the five years that um, I was there. My son's been murdered and none of these officers, the justice system, the politicians, nobody cared. We've been in limbo for so long, so... Today is where we can look to start moving on and just, I don't know, try and get, take control of my life once more. Hi M&Ms, welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. The police and the CPS have defined a hate crime as, quote, any criminal offence which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by hostility or prejudice based on a person's disability or perceived disability, race or perceived race, or religion or perceived religion, or sexual orientation or perceived sexual orientation or transgender identity or perceived transgender identity, end quote. A hate crime can be committed by a wide variety of people, including a friend, acquaintance or a complete stranger, and the term covers a wide range of crimes, including verbal abuse, harassment, intimidation, making threats and bullying another individual. Between 2016 and 2017, in 83% of cases that were prosecuted, the perpetrator pled guilty or was found guilty by a jury of their peers. The CPS are able to put in an application to the courts for a sentence uplift, whereby the imposed sentence on the perpetrator is increased due to the serious and violent nature of hate crimes. Doreen Graham was just 20 years old when she married Neville Lawrence in 1972. Having emigrated to the UK when she was just nine years old, Doreen, who preferred to be known as Joy, was born and raised by her grandmother in Jamaica. Her mother had moved over to the UK when Joy was young and had since remarried and went on to have other children. With Joy's mum at work, she almost took over the role of housewife looking after her half-siblings and regularly doing the housework. At school, Joy made significant friendships with other classmates, particularly children who were also from Jamaica. Doing well in school, Joy got a job at the National Westminster Bank when she left. It wouldn't be long before she met and had fallen in love with Neville Lawrence in 1970, when she was just 17 years old. Neville Lawrence was 10 years older than Joy and had emigrated to the UK from Jamaica in 1960. 
When he came over to the UK, Neville was already a trained upholsterer, having trained in his Jamaican hometown of Kingston. However, he found it extremely difficult to get a job in the UK, despite his training, and surmised that this was more than likely due to the fact that Neville was a black man. Whilst nowadays this is clear discrimination and considered by most as abhorrent behaviour, in the 1960s this was just seen as the norm. Neville was one of roughly 75,000 immigrants who were arriving in Britain each year in the mid-1960s, and at this time racism was rife, not just in the UK, but worldwide. It's clear that no one was prepared for the influx of immigrants coming into the UK in the 60s, and it left a clear divide between communities, a divide that is still visible today in certain communities and individuals. In 1966, a documentary was produced which demonstrated the lack of respect white people had for black people who had just come to the UK to find work in factories. The documentary was called Smethwick, A Straw in the Wind and shone a spotlight on the attitudes towards black people with landlords refusing to let their properties to them and even barbers refusing to provide them with haircuts. In the documentary, one young mother stated, quote, they should live in a district by themselves. They're not clean, end quote. A complaint from another man was that, quote, they're a nuisance when you've got to walk past them in the streets. They won't move, end quote. A study conducted by the University of Birmingham at the time suggested that 80% of individuals were not prepared to let their rooms to the thousands of migrants who had arrived in the Midlands forcing people to cram their typically large families into small houses, and immigrant families were used to being turned away for services, including church service, and were used to seeing signs in windows stating, quote, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, end quote. Joy, who was petite, and Neville being tall and broad-shouldered, married at Lewisham Registry Office in South East London in 1972, They were a hard-working couple, with Neville eventually landing a job as a carpenter, and Joy becoming a special educational needs teacher. Two years after they were wed, the couple welcomed their first child, Stephen. Stephen was a fussy baby who would frequently cry, and it appeared the only time he calmed down was when he was crawling. These were traits that Stephen carried with him into his early teen years, with Joy later describing him as being a restless teenager with bundles of energy. In 1976, the couple's middle child, Stuart, was born, and when Stephen was eight, his younger sister, Georgina, was born in 1982. Whilst Stephen and Stuart regularly fought as any normal brothers do, Stephen doted on his younger sister and always looked out for and protected her. The family lived on the Nightingale Estates in Woolwich, an estate that was mainly populated by white people. It was clear that Stephen probably wasn't destined for Oxford or Cambridge, however despite this he still performed well at school, where he was popular with fellow students and teachers alike. This was a result of Stephen's calm and warm nature, his friends could rely on him for advice and support, and teachers could trust him to always behave in their lessons and hand homework in on time. In an example of Stephen's reliable nature, His friend Dwayne Brooks recalls a time when a window in a classroom ended up being broken. When no one confessed to causing the damage, the teacher took Stephen aside and accused him of being the culprit. While he knew that Stephen wasn't actually the one who'd broken the window, the teacher hoped that Stephen would reveal the real individual behind the damage. However, whether Stephen really didn't know, or whether he was protecting a friend, he didn't reveal the name of the culprit. If this was Stephen protecting a classmate or friend, it demonstrates an innate sense of protectiveness and reliability. Stephen was polite, punctual and well-dressed, and this, it seems, was a reflection of his parents and their, quote, conservative, non-conformist, Christian, Jamaican blend of values, end quote. Not only was Stephen a model student, but his parents always broke the stereotype of a black family. They were extremely attentive towards Stephen's education and never failed to turn up to parents' evening or just turn up at the school unscheduled with questions. Whilst it appeared that Stephen excelled in any sport he attempted, which often left him with injuries and broken bones, ultimately, his preferred sport was athletics. 
Eventually, Stephen joined the Cambridge Harriers Club, where he competed in the 200 and 400 metres. A coach that trained Stephen stated, quote, He was a dedicated athlete, by far the best athlete in my group, and though he was very aware of this fact, he was never big-headed about it. On the contrary, he appeared almost embarrassed about his talent, end quote. Stephen Lawrence was just a typical teenager. He had odd jobs, including working in McDonald's. He enjoyed dating girls and was considered a flashy dresser. Despite Stephen's glowing descriptions, he had a typical teenage phase and began rebelling against his parents' rules. Not only that, but his school grades had started to spiral downwards also, enough for the teachers to take note. Stephen grew increasingly restless into his mid-teens, where he began making excuses to avoid attending church and could no longer be found sat at home completing homework. Instead, he just wanted to be out with his mates. This naturally developed some tension between parent and son, with Joy stating in her book, And I Still Rise, quote, He was, I suppose, going through a typical late adolescent phase. We at home were, generally speaking, always wrong, end quote. It's believed this rebellion stage was caused, in part, by unintended influences at the hands of his childhood friend, Dwayne Brooks. Stephen and Dwayne met on their first day of secondary school, Blackheath Blue Coat, when they were just 11 years old, but it took a good couple of years before the two became really good friends. In mid-1992, Dwayne went through a rough patch, and Stephen, being the reliable and supportive friend he was, supported Dwayne through these difficult times. But it was around about this time that Stephen started to rebel. You see, when the pair finished school, Dwayne left with poor GCSEs, and additionally moved out of his family home, leaving him to float between hostels. This freedom caused Stephen to become envious of his friend, and he began to resent his parents for implementing a curfew. While Stephen wasn't considered to be quite as intelligent as his classmates, he still went on to do a design technology A-level at Blackheath Bluecoat and an English language and literature A-level at Woolwich College. Stephen's long-term goal was to become an architect, a dream he'd carried with him from childhood. In April 1993, Stephen was very near to completing his A-level. However, teachers stated that success still wasn't a sure thing, with Stephen not being considered a top-of-the-class pupil, even when he really put the effort in, and would need a serious final push to achieve the grades he required. School reports regularly stated that Stephen could, quote, try harder, end quote. Naturally, Stephen faced a lot of discrimination for simply being a black person and had been the target of racism in the past. When Stephen was a child, he was regularly called names at primary school, and on another occasion, Stephen was spat at and insulted in the streets, just for being black. This, and the general attitudes at the time towards black people, made Stephen angry, and made him want to stand up and protest against racism, not just in the southeast of London, but the whole of the UK. Stephen knew many black individuals, his family were black, he had many black friends, and other individuals that attended the same church as the Lawrences were also black. This made Stephen fiercely protective over his family, friends and local community against the acts of discrimination. Despite all this, Stephen refused to let racism get in the way of his success and was determined to succeed no matter what or who got in his way. According to an article written in 2013 for the website politics.co.uk, quote, Historically, fascist regimes and organisations have been linked with the most violent and aggressive forms of racism. End quote. In the early 90s, the British National Party, a far right fascist political party, were active in South East London, which I can imagine must have exacerbated the already obvious tensions between black and white people. In 1991, Roland Adams, a fellow black male who was known to Stephen, was murdered in Thamesmead in a very obviously racist attack. This infuriated Stephen, and this infuriation was intensified, I'm sure, when the BNP congratulated the people of Thamesmead for, quote, defending their estate, end quote. 
That's when Stephen made the decision to put his anger and complete disgust of racism and discrimination to good use. Following the murder, at the concern of his parents, Stephen attended a protest march in Thamesmead. Whilst Joy begged him not to attend, as she feared for his safety, she would later go on to say, quote, He had a strong conviction where that was concerned, because it was his friend, end quote. The 22nd of April, 1993, was just like any other ordinary day for Stephen. At the time, there was a recession, which left Neville out of work and depressed, whilst Joy had just begun a humanities degree at Greenwich University. That morning, Joy was in Birmingham for her course, and Neville made the children breakfast. Stephen got up later than his siblings and had a cup of tea with his dad, sensing the emanating depression. Stephen then left for school, just as he would any other day. When the school gates opened and flocks of children rushed out to go home for the afternoon, Stephen and Dwayne met up and headed into Lewisham Town by bus. Afterwards, they headed to Stephen's maternal uncle's home and played video games there together and had dinner. It was some time later that evening that Stephen realised he'd completely forgotten that his father had asked him to be home for dinner, but even worse than that, he was now cutting it fine to get home for his 10.30pm curfew. When Stephen and Dwayne arrived at the Well Hall Road bus stop at 10.25pm, there were no buses in sight. Anxious that the minutes were ticking by and it was getting later and later beyond Stephen's curfew, he began to consider other ways he could get home in a fairly speedy manner to reduce the inevitable tension it would cause between him and his parents. Stephen walked down the road from the bus stop to see if a bus was on its way towards them. Whether Stephen hadn't seen them or he chose not to acknowledge them is unclear, but whichever reason, Dwayne seems to have been the only person to have seen the group of six white youths that were headed towards Stephen and Dwayne on the opposite side of the road. However, the reason behind this doesn't matter, as I highly doubt it would affect the outcome of that night. At 10.38pm, just eight minutes past their curfew, Dwayne called out to Stephen to see if he could see a bus on its way. The group of white youths clearly overheard this question, as they then shouted a racial slur in the direction of Dwayne and Stephen. Within seconds, the group of youths had made their way across the road and ambushed Stephen, before proceeding to stab Stephen at least twice, once in the right collarbone and once in the left shoulder. If we'd known that the bus was going to take so long, the 122 to come, we would have just jogged it. If straight ahead of me is 12 o'clock where Stephen's standing, then at 10 o'clock I remember this group of white boys on the other side of the road shouting. <laughs> and I just saw this guy strike a downward blow, which I thought was a weapon. Come on, Steve! He wasn't running properly, he was running lopsided and he kept saying to me, Dwayne, Dwayne, like, what's happened to me, what's happened to me? The stab wounds were approximately five inches deep and resulted in one of his lungs partially collapsing, as well as several arteries being severed. Dwayne began running towards his injured friend and shouted at him to also run away to safety. The youths ran off in a different direction while Stephen and Dwayne ran towards Shooter's Hill. Stephen managed to run 130 yards before collapsing and bleeding to death. Stephen was taken to Brook General Hospital just 25 minutes after the attack, but it was too late. Stephen Lawrence, who was just 18 years old, was already deceased. The attack was all over within 20 seconds. 20 seconds, one third of a minute, and Stephen's life was ripped from him. He would never sit his exams, he'd never be able to progress into a career as an architect, he'd never have children of his own. Neville and Joy's eldest son, whom they loved so deeply, was stolen from them before he even had the chance to proceed into adulthood. Stuart and Georgina's reliable, passionate, trustworthy brother was taken from them in such a heinous way. Dwayne Brooks not only lost a good friend, but witnessed him be murdered, powerless to prevent the violent attack inflicted upon his close friend. In a completely unprovoked attack, 
one simply fueled by racism and discrimination. Stephen Lawrence fought to the very end, until the effects of the attack became too overwhelming. There was a significant lack of blood at the scene of the attack, or following the route Stephen and Dwayne ran. However, this was to be expected considering Stephen was wearing five layers of clothes at the time. The blood would begin to pool when Stephen finally collapsed to the ground, just 130 yards away from where he had been fatally stabbed. It's believed that here, on the cold, hard pavement, was where Stephen took his last breath. The autopsy demonstrated that he more than likely passed away before the ambulance had even arrived, more than likely just minutes after he hit the ground. In fact, pathologist Dr. Shepard is surprised Stephen was able to run at all. Quote, It is surprising that he managed to get 130 yards with all the injuries he had, but also the fact that the deep, penetrating wound on the right side caused the upper lobe to partially collapse his lung. It is therefore a testimony to Stephen's physical fitness that he was able to run the distance he did before collapsing. End quote. It quickly became evident that this was unequivocally a brutal attack that could be explained in no other way than being racially motivated. Stephen wasn't in a gang, he'd had no prior involvement with the police, he wasn't known to have any criminal associations, and no alcohol or drugs were found in his system post-mortem. He was just a normal, loved teenage boy who excelled at athletics and wished to be an architect trying to get home to his parents on the evening of the 22nd of April, 1993. Stephen and Dwayne weren't the only ones present that evening. There were already three people at the bus stop that night who witnessed Stephen be attacked. Whilst these three people all witnessed the brutal attack and were able to tell police that it was over within seconds, none of them were able to identify any suspects. However, it quickly became apparent that police didn't need witnesses. Plenty of people came forward within the first few days of the murder, providing police with names of individuals they believed were involved in the murder. Two anonymous letters, one left in a phone box and one left on a police officer's car, became tantamount to the police's investigation. Whilst I'm not a handwriting expert, I feel it's entirely likely that these two letters were written by the same person. The letter in the phone box stated, quote, The people involved in first night stabbing are 1. Neil Acourt 2. David Norris 3. Jamie Acourt 4. Gary Dobson Number 1 and 2 are also rumoured with Wimpy Bar stabbing brackets Eltham. Number 1 was definitely seen in the area prior to stabbing. Names 2 and 3 are ringleaders and positive knife users. Names 1, 2 and 3 share house in Bournebrook Road, Redbrook. Name 4 lives in Phineas Pet Road. One of the names stabbed that poor lad. The names 1 and 2 are very dangerous knife users, who always carry knives and quite like using them. Names 1 and 2 have stabbed before. Stacey Benefield was their victim about 6 weeks ago. He lives in Purney's Road off Rochester Way. These bastards were definitely involved and must be stopped because they keep getting away with it. This is not a BNP related incident. Approach these shits with care. Do us all a favour and prove it. Good luck. End quote. Having read the first and second letter in full, it becomes even more obvious to me that they are written by the same individual, not only because of the handwriting, but because of the way it's written out, the way the letter is phrased, and even the order in which the names are presented. The letter placed on the police officer's windshield states, quote, 1. Neil Acourt 2. Dave Norris 3. Jamie Acourt, 4. Gary Dobson, were involved in stabbing in Well Hall Road. Names 1 and 2 are also rumoured for Wimpy Bar stabbing, brackets, Altham. Also, same two stabbed Stacey Benefield in Purney's Road off Rochester Way. 1, 2 and 3 live in Bournebrook Road, Redbrook. 4. Lives Phineas Pet Road, Altham. All known to use and carry knives openly. These must be stopped as are very dangerous beings. This is not BNP-related incident. Approach with care. It's down to you to prove it. You will come up trumps. Name one was seen in area of stabbing, plus other lads not quite identifiable as it was dark. Not sure what one stabbed that poor lad. We'll find killer if you hunt these. Good luck. End quote. 
Her name not mentioned in these notes, but is mentioned as being a named suspect in the early days of the investigation, is Luke Knight, an apparent associate and possible gang member involved with the other four. The five were known to police and were known racists, being involved in several racially motivated incidents in the months leading up to Stephen's death. About a month before Stephen's attack, Gary Dobson and Neil Acourt verbally abused and attempted to stab Kevin London. Jamie Acourt, Neil's brother, was believed to have been involved in another two stabbings, Darren Witham in May 1992 and Darren Giles in 1994, which resulted in Darren Giles suffering a heart attack. Neil and Jamie Acourt, David Norris and Gary Dobson were also linked with a further two stabbings that occurred in March 1993. Both of these were mentioned in the anonymous letters. Stacey Benefield was mentioned by name in the letters, who was a white man stabbed in the chest by David Norris, potentially in an effort to be initiated into the A-Courts gang. Just the day after Stephen's murder, a man who has been given the pseudonym James Grant walked into the police station and gave them information on the stabbing. According to the recording of the interview, James Grant told police, quote, Acorts call themselves the Krays. In fact, you can only join their gang if you stab someone. They carry knives and weapons most days. David Norris stabbed Stacey Benefield a month ago in order to prove himself. End quote. It appeared to the police interviewing James that he wasn't just passing on idle gossip he'd heard on the street, that he'd learnt this information from having much more personal involvement with the gang. Stacey Benefield wasn't the only person believed to have been stabbed by a member of the gang. Gurdeep Bangal was attacked outside his father's wimpy franchise in Eltham on the 11th of March 1993, and was mentioned in the letter as the wimpy bar stabbing in Eltham. Gurdeep confronted a group of white youths, who he's convinced included David Norris, who were banging on the windows of the shops before he was stabbed. Quote, the knife went in from the side of my stomach, through my bowel, and missed my spine by about a centimetre. End quote. Despite suspects being identified within days of the murder, arrests wouldn't be made for weeks. But, more apparent than that, if you know the case well enough, you'll know convictions weren't made and justice wasn't achieved for many years to come. The Friday morning following the murder, Police set up an instant room, with Detective Chief Superintendent Ian Crampton heading it up. That day, they began searching the local area where Stephen was murdered and performed house-to-house inquiries. At 7.45pm, a young man walked into the station with information regarding Stephen's murder. This was the man who told police that the A-Courts called themselves the Craze and informed them that it was David Norris who had stabbed Stacey Benefield. This is where the failures of the police began. Detective Constable Christopher Budgeon was the first to meet with the informant known as James Grant and informed Detective Inspector Benjamin Bullock, second in command of the investigation. D.I. Bullock failed to go into the interview with D.C. Budgeon and instead simply told him to record it. For the future inquiry, D.I. Bullock admitted, quote, If I have one regret, it is that I didn't see that man. End quote. For years, the police had claimed that there was a wall of silence surrounding the suspects, but it's entirely apparent now that this was not the case. With the two anonymous letters naming the gang, James Grant naming the gang, and a further anonymous woman phoning police twice on the day following the murder, stating that Stacey Benefield had been stabbed by the, quote, two boys who call themselves the Craze, end quote, police had enough reasonable suspicion to arrest the Acourt brothers, David Norris and Gary Dobson, however Steele failed to do so. The reasoning behind this, given by Detective Chief Superintendent Brian Whedon at the inquiry, was that he was unaware he could make an arrest simply on the basis of reasonable suspicion. In all honesty, the entire investigation within the first few weeks was an absolute shambles. Statements weren't taken for days or even weeks after the individual made contact with the police. Surveillance on the suspects failed miserably. Arrests weren't made in an adequate time, causing forensic evidence they could have found days after the murder to be lost forever. It appeared that the police were taking an extremely laid-back and nonchalant approach to this case, 
and it can be surmised that this was either a result of incompetent police officers or, more seriously, institutionalised racism. It wouldn't be until two weeks following the murder that arrests were made in the case, however, at the inquiry, the area's police chief, Deputy Assistant Commissioner David Osland, admitted that the evidence police had at the time of the arrest was exactly the same as the evidence they possessed 48 hours following the murder. He claimed the delay in arresting suspects was partly due to intolerable pressure. On Friday the 7th of May 1993, at 6.30am, Neil and Jamie Acourt and Gary Dobson were arrested in their homes for the murder of Stephen Lawrence. David Norris spent a few days in hiding before finally handing himself in to police and being arrested three days later. Neil Acourt was picked out at an identity parade and was charged with murder on the 13th of May 1993. Luke Knight was arrested on the 3rd of June and was eventually charged with murder on the 23rd of June. However, the victory was short-lived as the charges were then dropped on the 29th of July 1993 by the CPS due to insufficient evidence. Understandably extremely disappointed with the lack of movement on their son's case, Neville and Joy initiated a private prosecution against the five suspected murderers. Although the Lawrences faced another blow when they discovered they were not entitled to legal aid and therefore had to come up with the funds themselves before they could move forward with the prosecution, It wasn't just funds for lawyers and for the trial to go ahead, but for the forensic evidence to be re-examined, and for tracing and re-interviewing witnesses. Before the trial began, the charges against Jamie Acourt and David Norris were dropped, once again due to a lack of evidence. The trial began in early 1996, where the family were represented by Michael Mansfield, QC, Martin Sordew and Margot Boy, who worked pro bono. After all the years of planning, all the money and hard work that went into making sure this trial was able to go ahead, the Lawrence family would doubt another devastating blow when Gary Dobson, Neil Acourt and Luke Knight were found not guilty of the murder of Stephen Lawrence. It's believed this is partly a result of the Honourable Mr Justice Curtis's ruling that Duane's identification of the suspects was unreliable. At the time, due to the law of double jeopardy, this acquittal meant that the three accused could never be tried again under any circumstance. An inquest into the death of Stephen Lawrence was held in February 1997. The five accused teenagers were ignorant and childish during the hearing at Southwark Coroner's Court in South London. The wall of silence surrounding the murder was also maintained throughout the hearing, with the five youths refusing to answer any questions presented to them, and continued to claim the common law rights of privilege against self-incrimination. Every time the accused were asked a question, even to confirm their name, they responded, quote, I am claiming privilege on that question. End quote. This continued ignorance and mockery of the hearing infuriated Michael Mansfield QC for the Lawrence family. As the hearing progressed, he became increasingly enraged, telling the court, quote, It's completely pointless. These young men have decided to say absolutely nothing on any occasion to absolutely anything. It's an abuse. He's an automaton. He's standing there claiming privilege on everything, end quote. The inquest into Stephen's death was finalised on the 13th of February 1997, where the jury deliberated for just 30 minutes before returning a verdict of unlawful killing, quote, in a completely unprovoked racist attack by five white youths, end quote, with the coroner following this finding up with, quote, A young man has been killed in cold blood for no other reason than that the colour of his skin was black. In July 1997, the then Home Secretary, Right Honourable Jack Straw, MP, ordered an inquiry into Stephen's death, and on the 31st of July, he announced in Parliament that the aim of the inquiry would be, quote, to inquire into the matters arising from the death of Stephen Lawrence, 
on 22 April 1993 to date, in order particularly to identify the lessons to be learned for the investigation and prosecution of racially motivated crimes. End quote. The inquiry, known as the McPherson Report, concluded that there were many failures on behalf of the police with regards to the investigation undertaken into Stephen's murder. However, they were provided with no evidence to suggest that there was any collusion or corruption within the Metropolitan Police Service that interfered with the investigation. Paragraph 1 in Chapter 46 of the McPherson Report, entitled Conclusion and Summary, says... The conclusions to be drawn from all the evidence in connection with the investigation of Stephen Lawrence's racist murder are clear. There is no doubt but that there were fundamental errors. The investigation was marred by a combination of professional incompetence, institutional racism and a failure of leadership by senior officers. A flawed MPS review failed to expose those inadequacies. The second investigation could not salvage the faults of the first investigation. End quote. The inquiry was concluded in February 1999 and was sent by Sir William McPherson of Clooney, who chaired the inquiry, to the Right Honourable Jack Straw, MP, on the 15th of February. The letter that accompanied the report said, quote, Dear Home Secretary, on 31st of July 1997, you asked me to inquire into the matters arising from the death of Stephen Lawrence in order particularly to identify the lessons to be learned for the investigation and prosecution of racially motivated crimes. The three people appointed to support me in my task were Mr Tom Cook, the Right Reverend Dr John Santamu and Dr Richard Stone. They have acted as full members of a team in all respects. I am pleased to tell you that the inquiry report, which I delivered to you today, is accepted by all three advisers in its entirety. The report therefore sets out our unanimous views, based upon the evidence and material put before us during both parts of the inquiry. I take personal responsibility for all that is set out in the report. There were many matters that contributed to the failure of the investigation into Stephen's death, Paragraph 2 of chapter 46 states, quote, At least now many of the failures and flaws are accepted. For too long, the family and the public were led to think that the investigation had been satisfactorily carried out. The belated apologies offered at this inquiry acknowledge the truth, but there is no remedy for the grief which the unsuccessful investigation piled upon the grief caused by the murder itself. End quote. The inquiry found that not a single officer that attended the scene even attempted to perform first aid, except for attempting to determine if Stephen was still breathing and still had a pulse, which led to a strong criticism of police officers' training and retraining in first aid. The inquiry also noted a huge lack of direction and organisation during the first few hours of the investigation. The numerous officers that attended the scene weren't used properly in order to attempt to identify and ascertain any suspects, and this can be put down to a lack of direction by senior officers, quote, many of whom attended the scene, who seem simply to have accepted that everything was being done satisfactorily by someone else, end quote. The contact police had with Stephen's family from the outset was appalling, Joy and Neville were treated with insensitivity and a distinct lack of sympathy. There was a significant failure of the family liaison officer appointed to the Lawrences. They were continually patronised and were denied important information regarding the investigation. Them and Dwayne Brooks, who witnessed his close friend's murder, were treated extremely inadequately and unprofessionally, according to the report. Chapter 47 of the report outlines the recommendations proposed by Sir William McPherson and his counterparts. Primarily, the recommendation was that a ministerial priority be established for all police services in order to, quote, increase trust and confidence in policing amongst minority ethnic communities, end quote. They recommended that the definition of a racist incident should be defined as, quote, any incident which is perceived to be racist by the victim or any other person, end quote, and that this definition should be adopted universally across the police, local government and other agencies. 
They also proposed that codes of practice be established by the Home Office to ensure a comprehensive system of reporting and recording all racist incidents and to ensure that all police services were investigating racially motivated crimes equally. Family liaison officers were required to be readily available and trained specifically in racism awareness and cultural diversity to ensure that families are treated appropriately and professionally without discrimination. It was recommended that police services develop guidelines to ensure victims and witnesses are handled correctly by the police, especially during racially motivated incidents. There were also a few recommendations made with regards to training within the police force. It was suggested that first aid training be provided to all public contact police officers and that a review must be made to ensure they all have the basic skills required to perform first aid. They asked that officers be taught to, quote, think first aid, end quote, first and foremost, particularly A, B, C, airway, breathing and circulation. On top of first aid, it was also recommended that police officers of all levels receive training with regards to racism awareness and that this training is regularly updated. Focusing outside of the police force, the inquiry also considered preventing racism from a young age by amending the national curriculum to ensure that the value of cultural diversity is recognised. It also suggested that schools implemented strategies to both prevent and address racism and that Ofsted, the Office for Standards and Education, examine the implementation of the strategies during their inspection of schools. Other recommendations made included the standard of proof of racist crime should remain unchanged, the powers of the police to stop and search should remain unchanged, and that police authorities should look at recruiting and retaining minority ethnic staff. A significant outcome of the McPherson Report is that the Double Jeopardy Law, which had been in place for 800 years, was banned in April 2005. Double jeopardy meant that once an individual was tried and acquitted of a crime, they were not permitted to be retried again under any circumstance. The abolishment of this law means that an individual can now be retried for a crime, providing there is, quote, new and compelling evidence, end quote, such as new DNA evidence, witnesses, or a confession. Double jeopardy wasn't abolished across the board, however, and remains in force for lesser offences. It does apply to the most serious of crimes, murder, rape, class A drug offences and war crimes, according to a BBC News article written just days after the law was banned. This meant that, if significant new evidence was found in the Stephen Lawrence case, the suspects could be retried. Additionally, in 1999, Dwayne Brooks sued the police under the Race Relations Act over the psychiatric injuries he suffered as a result of the mishandling of Stephen's case and the, quote, failure to provide the same quality service as they would to a white person, end quote. Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Paul Condon was amongst the individuals sued for, quote, negligence for failing to ensure the officers did not behave in a racist manner, end quote, according to Dwayne's solicitor. Regarding the case, Dwayne said, quote, The main reason I am pursuing this case is that I do not wish the same occurrences to take place with other members of our society in the future. I feel a great sense of sadness and distrust when officers of the law can behave with such racist conduct and not be penalised for their actions, end quote. Whilst the legal action against the police began in 1999, it didn't come to an end until March 2006. In 2002, the Court of Appeal ruled that Duane could sue the police for negligence and wrongful arrest, and furthermore could sue 13 police officers for breaching the Race Relations Act. However, in 2005, the House of Lords deemed that Duane was unable to sue the police for negligence, but could pursue with the other claims if we wished to do so. In 2006, Scotland Yard came to a settlement with Duane, offering him a £100,000 payout and a written apology. Scotland Yard's statement regarding this settlement stated, quote, This has been a protracted and difficult period for all persons involved, and was initially born out of the tragic racist murder of Stephen Lawrence and the attack on Dwayne Brooks, end quote. 
A cold case review was commenced in June 2006, which included a re-examination of the forensic evidence the police had from the original investigation. As a result of this examination, a microscopic bloodstain that was proven to belong to Stephen was discovered on one of Gary Dobson's jackets. The size of the stain implied that the blood had gotten onto the jackets quickly and wasn't a result of transfer from another surface. Additionally, on items of clothing that belonged to Gary Dobson and David Norris, fibres from an item of Stephen's clothing was found, along with hairs that had a 99.9 chance of belonging to him. As a result of this find, as it was new and significant evidence, this now meant that Dobson and Norris could officially be retried for Stephen's murder. The cold case review took four years to complete, and finally, on the 8th of September 2010, Dobson and Norris were arrested uncharged for the racially motivated murder of Stephen Lawrence. Just over a month later, on the 23rd of October, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Keir Starmer QC, applied to the Court of Appeal for Dobson's, who was already in prison at the time on unrelated drug offences, previous acquittal to be quashed. Knowing there would be intense public interest in this retrial, reporting restrictions were implemented, meaning the arrests were not public knowledge at the time, to allow for a fair trial. A two-day hearing took place on the 11th and 12th of April 2011, where it was decided that Dobson's acquittal would be quashed to enable him to stand trial for a second time. On the 14th of November 2011, a jury was selected, and, the following day, the trial commenced at the Old Bailey, presided over by Mr Justice Treacy. Finally, Stephen Lawrence's family may finally get the justice they'd been waiting 18 long years for. Mark Ellison QC for the Lawrence family took the jury back to that dark, cold, fateful night in April 1993 when a promising, bright and loving student was brutally murdered simply for the colour of his skin. He told the jury, quote, The only discernible reason for the attack was the colour of his skin. The way in which the attack was executed indicates that this group were a group of like-minded young, white men who acted together and reacted together. They shared the same racial animosity and motivation, end quote. They were then presented with the new evidence discovered to put Dobson and Norris at the scene of the crime and prove they were the murderers. Particularly, they were informed of the 16 fibres and the bloodstain, which held one in a billion chance that it did not belong to Stephen Lawrence on items of Dobson's clothing. Furthermore, the evidence also included seven fibres and two black hairs that were found on items of Norris's clothing that belonged to Stephen. This placed both individuals firmly at the scene, but not only present, extremely close to Stephen Lawrence. The microscopic blood stain placed Dobson at the scene when Stephen was being stabbed. Quote, The Crown's case is that the only reasonable inference to be drawn from the combination of new findings is that the material discovered on each of the defendant's clothes, seized 15 days after the murder, indicates that they must have been members of the group that attacked Stephen Lawrence that night and that they are guilty of his murder. End quote. On day two of the trial, several witnesses took to the stand to describe what they'd seen that night. Royston Westbrook, who told the court that the attack lasted no longer than ten seconds, was the first to take to the stand. Quote, they surrounded the pair of them and grabbed Dwayne Brooks' wrists. Dwayne managed to get away and shouted, Leave Stephen, or Run Stephen. He went down. I couldn't really tell whether he was lying on the floor or crouching down. It looked like someone was punching Stephen. One of the white boys lifted his leg to kick him, and Stephen came out between his legs and staggered up. He crossed the road and ran for his life. End quote. Alexandra Marie, a French au pair that had not even been in England for a month at the time of the murder, was the second witness to take to the stand. She told the court, quote, One of the white men was kicking the first young black man. He tried to protect himself. 
The second young black man ran away, and he arrived at the bus stop, and turned and shouted, Run, Stephen, run! End quote. On the 3rd of January 2012, Gary Dobson and David Norris were found guilty of the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Both Doreen and Neville Lawrence made statements in response to the guilty verdicts. I will begin by reading you Doreen's. Quote, This has been a very difficult time for me, and I would like to thank all those people that have expressed kindness and support for me and my family over the last 18 years. I would also like to thank the jury for their verdicts today. However, despite these verdicts, today is not a cause for celebration. How can I celebrate when my son lies buried, when I cannot see him or speak to him? When will I see him grow up and go to university? or get married or have children. These verdicts will not bring my son back. How can I celebrate when I know that this day could have come 18 years ago if the police, who were meant to find my son's killers, had not failed so miserably to do so? These are not a reason to celebrate. All I now feel is relief that two of my son's killers have finally been caught and brought to justice. Relief that these racist men can no longer think that they can murder a black man and get away with it. Relief that despite the defence being able to raise issues of contamination, the jury saw through it. I feel relieved that, to some extent, I can move forward with my life. But mixed with relief is anger. Anger that me and my family were put through 18 years of grief and uncertainty, not knowing if or when we would ever get justice. Had the police done their job properly, I would have spent the last 18 years grieving for my son, rather than fighting to get his killers to court. Anger that, despite the police saying that this case was so important to them, the exhibits were treated in such a way the defence could suggest contamination. This result shows that the police can do their job properly, but only if they want to. I only hope that they have learnt their lesson, and don't put any other family through what we have been put through. The fact is that racism and racist attacks are still happening in this country and the police should not use my son's name to say that we can move on. Now that we have some sort of justice, I want people to think of Stephen other than as a black teenager murdered in a racist attack in South East London in April 1993. I know that's the fact, but I now want people to remember him as a bright, beautiful young man who any parent of whatever background would have been proud of. He was a wonderful son and a shining example of what any parent would want in a child. I miss him with a passion. Hopefully now he can rest in peace. End quote. Neville Lawrence said, quote, My life was torn apart by the senseless murder of my son over 18 years ago. Unfortunately, no one was brought to justice before a court at that time, as they should have been. The loss itself, together with a lack of justice, have meant that I have not been able to rest all this time. I am therefore full of joy and relief that today, finally, two of my son's killers have been convicted for his murder. They will be sent to prison and forced to face the consequences of their actions. Consequences which my family and I have been living with all these years. I would like to thank the police and prosecutors for their faultless preparation and delivery of the case. I would like to thank the judge for the work he has put in to ensure that the suspects had a fair trial. I thank the jury for their careful attention to my son's case, day after day, and the verdicts they have delivered. Something has happened over the last seven weeks. I have watched justice being done. As for me, I'm not sure where I will go from here. I will let this good news sink in for some time. However, I'm also conscious of the fact that there were five or six attackers that night. I do not think I'll be able to rest until they are all brought to justice. End quote. Mr Justice Treacy described the murder of Stephen Lawrence as a, quote, terrible and evil crime, end quote that, quote, scarred the conscience of the nation, end quote. As he sentenced Dobson and Norris on the 4th of January 2012, he went on to say, quote, a totally innocent 18-year-old youth, on the threshold of a promising life, was brutally cut down in the streets in front of eyewitnesses by a racist, thuggish gang. 
You were both members of that gang. End quote. Mr. Justice Tracy also goes on to say that whilst it's evident this wasn't a premeditated murder, it was still a crime that wasn't completely one that occurred in the moment. Quote, Whilst the attack on Stephen Lawrence himself clearly could not have been premeditated, since it was a chance encounter, I cannot accept that a crime of this type simply arose on the spur of the moment. The way in which the attack took place strongly suggests to me that your group, if not actively seeking out a victim, was prepared, if opportunity arose, to attack in the way in which you did." End quote. Mr. Justice Treacy advised the now grown men in their thirties that they will be sentenced to detention at Her Majesty's pleasure for their role in the murder. He informed Dobson and Norris of their sentences and the reasonings behind them. Quote, Gary Dobson, you are now 36. At 17 years and 10 months, you were very nearly 18 when you murdered Stephen Lawrence. You are serving a five-year sentence for drug supply offences. It would be unjust to grant you credit for any time spent in custody awaiting trial on this matter. I therefore decline to grant you any credit for time already spent in custody, pursuant to Section 240 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003. In addition, there is no just reason why you should be able effectively to write off the remainder of the custodial element of the drug supply sentence, so I will increase the minimum term for this offence to prevent you receiving an underserved benefit. I take note of two positive reports from HMP Balmarsh. Taking account of all the circumstances referred to above, the sentence of the court for the murder of Stephen Lawrence is one of detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. I specify a minimum term to be served of 15 years and 2 months. David Norris, you are now 35 years old. You were 16 years and 8 months old at the time of the offence. Since 1993, you have been in trouble for dishonesty, and in 2002 you received 12 months imprisonment for racially threatening words or behaviour. This confirms my view, and no doubt that of the jury, that you were a violent racist in 1993. You were just over a year younger than Dobson. I shall make allowance for that in fixing the minimum term, but not a great deal since there is nothing to suggest that you were anything other than a full member of your gang, with any age differences being less relevant than the fact of membership, participation and identification with its aims. I do not regard delay as a mitigating factor. That and hostility towards yourself and your family arises from your own actions. Taking account of all the circumstances in your case, the sentence of the court for the murder of Stephen Lawrence is one of detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. I specify a minimum term to be served of 14 years and 3 months. End quote. In response to the sentences, Dorian Lawrence noticed the low minimum terms imposed on the two convicted, however acknowledged that the judge's hands were tied in this decision and stated, quote, It's the beginning of starting a new life, end quote. Out of the five originally accused, only two have been charged and convicted of Stephen's murder. So, what became of the other three individuals linked to the murder? You can always trust the Sun to report on these questions. As of 2018, when an article in The Sun was written, Luke Knight was living in a top floor flat in Eltham, just three miles away from where the murder took place. Knight, who was a dad of two and a roofer, apparently showed no remorse when the reporters from The Sun tracked him down. Jamie Acourt, whose cousin Sadie Stewart is married to Elliot Wright from The Only Way is Essex, was living as a fugitive under the name Simon Alfonso in a celebrity hotspot in Marbella for two years until December 2018, when he was no longer one of Europe's most wanted men. Along with his brother, Neil, Jamie Acourt ran a cannabis smuggling ring worth upwards of £3 million. In December 2018, Jamie Acourt pled guilty to conspiracy to supply cannabis resin between January 2014 and February 2016, and was sentenced to nine years at Her Majesty's pleasure. Jamie's older brother, Neil Acourt, is currently serving six years at Her Majesty's pleasure after being convicted in February 2017 in relation to the smuggling ring. 
In 2004, the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust was founded in his memory. The Trust works hard to ensure that every voice is heard, no matter the background the individual comes from, and to ensure that everyone gets equal opportunities in life. They work with young people to ensure they have the skills and qualifications they require to go on to further education, and they work to, quote, bridge the gap between young people in disadvantaged communities and the police, end quote. To date, they have supported 130 students to begin their journey into becoming an architect. In addition to helping young people qualify to become an architect, they support people from underrepresented backgrounds to get and keep a job in the architect industry. In order to achieve this, the Trust works closely with Urban, a recruitment specialist, in order to support candidates with CVs and provide advice for interviews and interview preparation. The Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust does lots of work, but ultimately its main goal is to unite individuals from all backgrounds, ensure everyone has the same opportunities, skills and knowledge, and to provide a voice and support to those from underrepresented backgrounds. This was a brutal murder, based on Stephen's skin colour. That's all there was to it. Stephen didn't aggravate the youths in any way, he didn't start a fight or an argument, He didn't insult them or hurl abuse at them. He was simply born as a black man and grew up in a time when people were offended and segregated by the colour of someone's skin. Black people were, and as we've seen with cases such as George Floyd and Elijah McClain, still are considered dangerous individuals, for no other reason than the fact that they weren't born white. There is no evidence to prove that black individuals are more violent than whites, A black person can simply be walking their dog, going for a jog, just being, and they could still be perceived as a threat. The Black Lives Matter movement doesn't suggest that only black lives matter. It acknowledges white privilege and that there is a clear divide. The Black Lives Matter movement doesn't express that only black lives matter. It's a movement that demands for black lives to matter just as much as white lives do. Yes, All lives matter, but currently, black lives are considered expendable. Black people are not considered as worthy as white people are. They're not worthy of walking down the street safe and just stop and searches. They're not worthy of going shopping. The Black Lives Matter movement is in place to demand equality. Only when there is equality across the board, when black lives matter just as much as white lives, then all lives will matter. We live in an unjust, unequal and unfair world and the only people that can turn this around is us. We need to better ourselves. It's never too late to learn. We need to take the time to read upon racism, on the discrimination black people face on a daily basis and pass on what we've learnt to younger generations. We need to better ourselves and build a more accepting, understanding and fair generation below us. Nelson Mandela said, quote, No one is born hating another person because of the colour of his skin, or his background, or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposites. End quote. In a racist society, it is not enough to be non racist. We must be anti racist. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, 
head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have an amazing week, and I'll see you all next week for another episode. Hi, I'm Christine, and I'd like to introduce you to the True Crime Files podcast, a bi-weekly podcast that focuses on mysterious disappearances and unsolved murders. Every two weeks, we'll be releasing an episode that'll help you get to know a case really well without having to invest a lot of your time. Derived from the articles upon the True Crime Files website, you'll find that our show covers a diversity of victims and perspectives. You'll probably also notice that our episodes are narrated by Scott Fuller from the Frozen Truth and Status Pending Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to the True Crime Files today so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for listening, being a part of our true crime community, and helping to shine a light on cases that might otherwise be overlooked or underreported.